Um, I was reading a, an article about relationships and things that a lot of times you read articles and they give you advice on how to help your relationships, like in your marriage, things that you should do. But this article was about things you should never do. And I want to share a few things that it mentioned. One of the things you should never do, it said, was to be a mind reader. And, and what they were referencing was about how we internalize things and assume things instead of communicating. So we may be bothered by something and we can draw a conclusion about the person we're in a relationship. You know, this is why she did such and such. This is why he did such and such. And never communicate. And so it said never be a mind reader. Another one it says <laughs> never operate in absolutes, right? In other words, you know, have, have you ever gotten into an argument or a dispute and your response is, you always do this, or you never do whatever this thing is? Anybody ever had that? In a, is that just my marriage? Come on now. <laughs> the reason being, because that cannot be true. So if you say, listen, you're never considerate, you may be having an issue with how they express consideration in the moment, but you can't say that person is never considerate. And what you do is you put that person on a defense. You mean the things that I have been doing that I thought was considerate don't mean anything? And so if you really want a person to not be considerate, tell them they're never considerate. And so don't deal with absolutes, right? So, so these are some things that you shouldn't do in a relationship. Well, I want to talk about one thing we should never do in our relationship with God, all right? There are things that we can do and say in our relationship with one another that are not helpful in that relationship. And I, today I want to spend some time talking about something we should never do in our relationship or in our loving of God. And so we're going to learn about this one thing from Genesis chapter 22. Now, let me give us a little con context on what we're going to be reading. This is about a man named Abraham. Abraham was called from God from a distant land to go and see a land that he would give him and his, his descendants, that Abraham would be a blessing. People would bless him. If they blessed him, they would be blessed. If they cursed him, they would be cursed. And through him, all the families of the earth would be blessed, right? And he went to this distant land. And Abraham is not a young person. He's an old person. And one of the things Abraham wanted was a, a, a son, right? He had wealth. He had servants. He said, basically, my descendants are actually just going to be the descendants of servants in my household. I won't really have any children. Lord, the Lord said, no, I'm going to bless you to have children. And God blessed him. At the age of 100, his wife at the age of 90. Yes, and G. Well, look here, man. You know, no grandparent help at all, right? They, they are the great grandparents, <laughs> you know. <laughs> to have a son uh, named Isaac. And so when we get to chapter 22, Isaac is probably a teenager at this point in time. And it comes a point where God calls Abraham to go to a mountain and sacrifice Isaac. Y'all, before we read, process that. Okay? If, if you have children, process that. Let alone just having one child, that was pretty much the only thing you asked God for. And so Abraham takes his son, goes to this mountain, and, and they get the sticks. This is a burnt offering, ladies and gentlemen. You sacrifice the animal. You burn it up basically to God. And, and, and he is laying his now teenage son on this makeshift altar. And his son said, listen, we, we got wood. We got fire. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham, says, Abraham basically said, God going to provide the sacrifice. And so Abraham is about to sacrifice his son. Ladies and gentlemen, the way that you would sacrifice the animal, 
I'm just, I can't make it but PG-13, is to slit the throat of the animal. And so he is about to do that with his only son of him and his wife. Let me clarify that, of he and his wife. And so here we are, Genesis chapter 22, and we're at verse 10. Verse 10. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his, thorn, by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided, right? And some of you King James, y'all know that's Jehovah Jireh, right? King James. The Lord will provide. Y'all, this is a very, very, I think, fundamental lesson, because I think it could kind of rattle us about this whole setup. If you're not uh, familiar with reading the Bible and understanding. Re the revelation of God is called a progressive revelation. He doesn't re re reveal everything about himself or every aspect of his plan in the beginning, but it happens through the course of time and in the culture in which he's revealing himself. And so here he is establishing a fundamental rule when it comes to him, right? This is a fundamental lesson coming through Abraham in the very first book of the Bible, and it's about priorities, right? Abraham was being tested in the sense of who takes priority. It, 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 is it Isaac or is it God, right? Is it the thing that you hold most precious on earth or is God the most precious thing to you? And so he is in this position where his actions have to give the answer. And I, and I want us to kind of put ourselves, at least relate as much as possible to this context. Because it's easy to say, I love God. It, it's easy to say, you know, whatever God calls me to do, I will do it. But when you're in a situation where faith is in conflict with everything you all did, Sometimes it feels too expensive to obey God, right? That it, it can cost too much, right? In the New Testament, there's an example of that. There was an encounter that a person had with, with Jesus. This is in Luke chapter 19, and it's often titled the rich young ruler. And this was a young person who had great wealth, who was a very religious person. People would say he was a very faithful person. He came to Jesus. He's coming to the right person and asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Right? And Jesus first talks about doing the things of the law. You know, have you done this? And he's like, I've been doing that since I was a child. Listen, I've been very faithful. And Jesus says, listen, if you want to be perfect, this is Luke chapter, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Now, if you know the story, his response was not to go liquidate all, his, all of his assets. In that moment, there was an evaluation. An evaluation to say, is the cost worth the benefit? Right? Right? And we all will find ourselves in a place, if you're genuinely trying to live and to give your life to the Lord, where you're going to have circumstances in your life when you're going to be asking yourself, is the cost worth the benefit? Right? I am called to forgive, right? I know I should forgive. But, but even like Peter, how many times should I forgive? Right? How, how, how deep can the hurt be and I'm still called to forgive? 
Jesus told his disciples to give without expecting to be paid back. Wait a minute, God. This person keeps coming to me. And they always have their hand out. Am I really expected to, to, to keep giving? Right? In your marriage. Listen, we've been to three counselors, Lord. At, at some point in time, it just needs to go the way that it's going. You, you want me to just keep holding on and keep fighting? And what you're doing is a cost analysis. Is this the cost worth the, the benefit? We do this in ministry, right? I know I should serve the Lord, but listen, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm watching these kids twice a week, and I'm tired. I don't even want to watch my own kids, let alone watch somebody else's kids, right? We got teachers and facilitators here. You think they want to do children's ministry at church? And we can get to a point where, okay, God, I know what you may want, but it doesn't feel like it's worth it. Even if I could afford it. A, a, a person on uh, Facebook, there's a, a Facebook group uh, in the Pearland area called Pearland Eats. And it's where people share, you know, their reviews of local restaurants. And so there was this new restaurant uh, that's open in town. It's a hamburger place. And one of the comments that I saw posted, they were talking about, went to this hamburger place. $75 for three people. Won't be going back. <laughs> right? And some of you guys said it. Y'all even, when I said $75 for three people, you were like, ooh. Right? That cost now, it's not the cost itself. It's what the cost is for, right? Because if I say it's new seafood restaurant, $75 for three people, you're like, oh, man, that's a great deal. Right? Where is it? But the same price for a different item, that's too expensive. Because you can, even though you could afford it both, one doesn't have the value in your mind as the other. And so when we don't want to do something that God wants us to do, it is not that we can't afford it. It's because we don't think it has sufficient value for our sacrifice, right? When we think about doing things for the God, you know, when I talked about serving, wait, wait, wait a minute, I have to think about my me time. You know, how, how much, how will this invade my, my time for myself? Or how will this impact other aspects of my life? And what we're doing in that moment is we're, in, we're evaluating eternal things against temporal values. And we're reversing what is most important. Well, I have to do this. And so I'll see if I can do that for you, Lord. This is the moment Abraham is dealing with. He has a priority and a value in Isaac. It is basically the only thing when you read Genesis that really Abraham asked for. And now God wants him to sacrifice him. And here's the answer that Abraham gives us to this whole question. What is the one thing we should never do in our loving of God? Here's the one thing you should never do. Hold back. Don't hold back. Abraham took that knife, and the messenger of the Lord didn't have to whisper Abraham. He had to say Abraham and repeat it. It was about to happen. It wasn't a mental thing. His actions were saying, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you even with the thing that's going to cost me the most in this life. And his actions said it. He didn't stay, stay down at the mountain saying, you know, God, I need you to do something before I go up. That's how many of times we will work. My right, God, if you want to do this, show me how you're going to move this around and make it easy for me. But no, his actions 
word to trust God and what he understood. Now, y'all, let me give a little disclaimer to somebody that might just turn off the video right now. If you're hearing voices about sacrificing your children, go get some help. That is not God. That is not God, all right? This is, this is given to us as an example, and I'm explaining the example. Don't do that. All right. <laughs> we may have to put that on the video, right? Editing. You know? <laughs> Do not try this at home. <laughs> but when you think about the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 6, it's called the great Shema. You know, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Right? And he says about basically a number one principle, number one command of God is to love him with everything right? With all your soul, with all your might, with all, everything. You don't hold anything back. It's the number one principle of God. He says, you got to put me first. You have to put me first and love me with everything, right? All of me for all of you, right? That's the song, right? That's what God wants is total surrender. But what's comfortable for us is partial surrender, Right? Because here's what we want to do. We want to give God a partial payment. A partial payment for all the benefits of his divinity. Y'all understand what I mean by a partial payment? Right? Let's say, you know, your rent is due and it's been tight. There's been a lot of other expenses and you owe $1,000, but you send the landlord $700. Because it's been tight. And that way I can kind of give you something with the assumption you will allow me to stay in the home while I have the other $300 for things that I think I want to apply them to, right? And it's very logical. That makes very sense. However, that's not your lease agreement. The landlord says, here is what you received based on this. You have to pay $1,000 per month. And the benefit is you get to stay in the house. You get to use this property as your own. It doesn't belong to you, but you get to use it as your own. But we'll want to give God partial payments in our faithfulness. And so we'll draw borders on our forgiveness. I'll forgive up until this point. I'll give up my time about this much a week, because other times, you know, I need some time, and it's partial payments. And Abraham is saying, don't hold back with God. Give him all of what he asked for. Don't just forgive one time. You could keep forgiving until he tells you to stop forgiving. And he's not going to tell you that. Because he doesn't do that with you. Right? This is a great principle. Right? For us to give God everything. How do you really do that, though? Right? Because we could live here, we could leave here and say, you know what, I'm going to give God everything. But the next time that family member comes back again, you know, you know we, the early one that I talked about? Uh, next time that person who has hurt you in your marriage comes, and, 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 I'm sorry. And, oh. No, God, I don't think I have it in me. H how is Abraham able to do this, right? Was he just, just some kind of super naturally blessed person when it comes to faith? Hebrews tells us something about what Abraham was thinking. So here's where I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 11, all right? This is real important. Hebrews chapter 11 is going to tell us what was in the mindset of Abraham at this time. All right, let me get there myself. All right, Hebrews 11, starting at verse 17. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, right? So this is what's happening. Verse 18, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. 
Y'all hear that? Hebrews is letting us know that Abraham was able to move forward because he just believed God would just raise him from the dead. Now, now how many resurrections had Abraham witnessed? It, for, for you Bible scholars, zero. Right? New Testament, Jesus, there's a bunch of them starting to happen. But Abraham saw zero resurrections, but some kind of way he says, well, God will just raise him from the dead. And why in the, why in the world would he come to that conclusion? Well, here's what he was banking on, that God keeps his promises. And God has promised descendants, right? He had me look at the stars and try and count them and say, so shall your descendants be. He says there are going to be descendants coming through Isaac and that the families of the earth will be blessed. And so if I sacrifice him, he's, he must going to bring him back to life. Because I know God can't lie. How did Abraham know God couldn't lie? Because Isaac existed. Y'all, we talk about the miracle of a 100-year-old man having a child. It's more of a miracle for a 90-year-old woman to give birth. Y'all follow me on that. We live in a day right now with some old people, some old men having children. But they tend to have children with younger women. I'm just I'm being honest. This is just biology, ladies and gentlemen. Y'all, Sarah was not in menopause. She was in menopause. You understand what I'm saying? There's nothing happening. And miraculously, she conceived a child, went the term, and gave birth. Every day for those 13 years, Isaac walked around. He saw God keeps his word. Every day when he asked Isaac to do something, he saw God keeps his word. And so when God says, I want to sacrifice you, want, want you to sacrifice your son, it would not erase the fact that God keeps his word. And some of you have a history where you have recognized God kept his word. And so if God kept his word then, why wouldn't he keep his word now? Right? That is the whole Romans 8.28, right? The whole Romans 8.28, for we know that for those who love God, God works things together for good. For those who love him, those called according to his purpose. That's what Abraham said. He says, I don't know how, right? He came to a conclusion that wasn't even right, but he was right about God. It's going to turn out good. And so in your forgiveness, in your waiting, when it feels like you don't want to wait anymore, when you're giving and it feels like I don't have anything else left to give, no, it's going to turn out good. That's every act of faith in all 66 books. Everybody who trusts God, it turns out good. Do you think <laughs> you are going to be the exception? Do you think your circumstance out of all of the millennia in Scripture will be the one time God let somebody down? And I know what you're thinking in those moments. In those moments, I listen, listen, God, you know, we, we, we've kind of crossed the threshold where I needed you to come through. Right? Have you ever felt that way? I and mean, let's be honest. Right? Well, you're really looking for this thing to be resolved in a certain way, and it didn't get resolved that way, right? You prayed for somebody, and it didn't come through. That person didn't get healed or whatever. We've all been there. We think, well, he, he, he let me down. How, how is this working together for good? And, and, and here's what you got to understand. You know, some of you guys know I have a second job. I deal with, with student loans, federal student aid. And so, like, there's borrowers who attended schools who made promises that they couldn't keep. And so they're paying loans to schools for, for debt for schools they attended that may not have been accredited. 
right? And so they can't even get the benefit of their education even though they have the loans. And so there's a thing called borrower defense. And you can file for borrower defense and that, that, that case is investigated and the loans connected with that education can be discharged, right? All of them. And so people will call and say, I received a letter that my loans are going to be discharged. But at the same time, I got this call from my servicer telling me payments about to start. Right? And matter of fact, I'm getting this discharge and I paid money and I thought I was going to get a refund. So what's happening? I said, well, listen, let me look at your case and I'll pull up the information. And I will look. And I would say, your case is still open. And they like, oh, okay, what, what good is that? I, I thought my loans were going to be discharged. I say, they will be discharged, right? Matter of fact, if you look at your account, some of the loans have already dropped off. Well, when will the other ones drop off? Or will I get my refund? I said, your case is still open. Here's what I'm trying to get at. When you cross that threshold where you thought God couldn't work things together, what you need to understand is he's still working. Y'all follow me? The case is still open. And you don't have to worry about the loans coming into repayment if you got the promise from the Department of Education that the loans are going to be discharged. God said in Romans 8, 20, hey, I work all things. All your hurt, all your sacrifice, all of your waiting, all of your giving, all of your praying, I work all of it. What about his evil? What about her bad statements and hurting my feelings? What about all the times they took advantage? I work it all together good for those who love me those called according to my purpose and so Abraham having no experience of resurrection moved forward trusting that a resurrection would happen ladies and gentlemen we have an advantage over Abraham <laughs> we know of a resurrection <laughs> And so we have even more reason to trust God. Abraham renamed the place God provides. Some of us need to rename some circumstances. God will provide, right? As a matter of fact, if you're in a place right now, take your phone out, put the date, God provides. And make it an annual reminder, right? Set it up as a repeating event on your phone. So that you can be reminded, if you see August 2024, you might be going through another thing. Instead of a birthday showing up, God will provide. And you can think back and think of your yesterday of how God got you through that situation. To know he'll get you through the ones to come. And so I want to encourage you, don't hold back. Love him and keep loving him, give and keep trusting him, forgive and keep trusting him, serve, keep serving him, and you will not be disappointed with God. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the blessing of your word. And you call for us to deny ourselves and to take up our cross and follow you. That in your word, Jesus, you told disciples that the person who wishes to save their life will lose it, but the person who loses their life for my sake will save it. And so we don't want I Surrender All to be a song that we sing occasionally, but for it to be the actions of our day-to-day -day life we're going to trust you and that we will rearrange our lives around you that you are our priority and how you would have us to move in this world 
is what we put our energy, our time, and our resources to. And God, I know you can't do anything but bless. We cannot outgive you. And so you always bless abundantly when we trust you. David did not say in the 23rd Psalm, there's something in my cup. He didn't say that my cup is filled adequately, that my cup is filled sufficiently. He said my cup overflows. And so you always bless far more than what we give. You said those who give, it will be given to them of good measure, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing, poured into their lap. And so I can't outgive you, God. So let me give you what I have. And we are to be not partial sacrifices, but living sacrifices. And so, God, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Lord, that first of all, what you call us to do is not something you didn't do yourself. <laughs> Abraham was stopped from sacrificing his son. But you didn't stop when it came to yours. That you call for us to sacrifice tenfold things for an eternal God. But you sacrificed your only begotten son for us. That temporal people could know eternal joy. And so I'm praying, God, that everybody in the sound of my voice today and beyond will trust you, would surrender their lives to you for your glory and our good. God, I thank you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Listen. If, amen. If, if you need to make a, a step of faith, if there's something you believe God is calling you to do or you're recognizing there's something I need to do, and I just need help doing it, we ask that you would connect with us at thewayoflifechurch.com slash connect or texting the word connect right now in this place or virtually uh, to 832-905-9046 is a way for us to help you in your connection with God, to help you know the blessing and joy of Jesus Christ. Y'all, he gave it all. There was no partial payment when it came to our salvation. So let's do the same. Let's give him full payment. Let's give him our whole selves. You won't be disappointed. I want to thank you for tuning in today. Those of you who are here um, virtually, thank you those of you who are here personally. Listen, please don't let what you understand and uh, amen today stay in this place all right be prayerful about how god wants to use his truth in your life not just your life but maybe a life connected to you amen let's pray heavenly father i thank you so much for this day i thank you so much for the worship i thank you so much for your word god i pray that one day we're going to be able to thank you face to face. We're going to be able to express our gratitude uh, to you and the one who died and rose again for us. But in the meantime, bless us with the mindset to serve you each and every day. And if it be your will for us to come back together and to sing songs to your glory again and hear a new revelation of your word, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, and have a blessed day.